The village of Blackthorn, was forgotten by time, nestled in a desolate valley between steep, jagged hills that seemed to keep the rest of the world at bay. Once, long ago, it had been in a thriving settlement, but now only a handful of families remained, their homes crumbling and their lives marked by an eerie sense of isolation. Yet the true darkness of Blackthorn lay beneath its soil, an ancient, cursed history that no one dared to speak of, not even in whispers. This was where Thomas Hewitt, a professor of archaeology and folklore, arrived on a crisp autumn afternoon. Hewitt had always been fascinated by ancient myths and legends, and Blackthorn had more than its share of both. For years, he had heard rumors of the village and its connection to the occult. There were stories of strange rituals, of ancient gateways to other worlds, and of the Blackthorn family, who had once ruled the village with an iron fist, and, it was said, had made a pact with something far worse than the devil himself. He wasn't alone on this expedition. A group of his students, eager to assist and experience true fieldwork, had joined him. There was Emily, a bright and inquisitive young woman with a knack for deciphering ancient languages, Jason, who was more interested in the thrill of exploration than the history behind it, Claire, a quiet but fiercely intelligent researcher, and Nick, the group's skeptic, who believed most ancient legends were nothing more than exaggerated stories. They had come to investigate the oldest building in Blackthorn, the abandoned Blackthorn Manor, a towering, decaying structure that loomed over the village like a corpse. According to local legend, the manor was built over the Devil's Gateway, a portal to hell itself, sealed centuries ago by dark magic. The last of the Blackthorn family had vanished in the early 1800s, and since then, the manor had been left to rot. The group's arrival at Blackthorn was greeted with a strange silence. No villagers came to meet them, and the streets were eerily empty. It felt as though the entire village was watching them from the shadows. They made their way to the old inn, the only place with a sign of life. The innkeeper, a gaunt man with hollow eyes, welcomed them with little more than a nod, his gaze lingering on them longer than necessary. As they settled in, Thomas explained their purpose, they were to explore Blackthorn Manor, search for artifacts, and document anything they found. The manor is old, yes, but it's also infamous. We need to be cautious, he warned. There are stories of people going missing inside, people who never came back. That night, as the group prepared to sleep, Emily noticed something odd, from her window, she could see a faint light flickering from within Blackthorn Manor. No one had lived there in over a hundred years, and yet the light danced and shifted as if someone, or something, was inside. Did you see that? She asked, pointing out the window to Claire. Claire frowned. Probably just the wind moving through the broken windows. These old places tend to play tricks on your eyes. Emily nodded, though uneasily. She couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was watching them. The next morning, the group set out for Blackthorn Manor. The path leading to it was overgrown with weeds and brambles, as though nature itself was trying to keep intruders away. The manor loomed ahead of them, a hulking, shadowed figure, its windows like hollow eyes staring down at them. The gates had long since rusted away, leaving only broken remnants. Inside, the air was thick with dust, the smell of decay, and mildew clinging to every surface. The grand hall was vast, with a sweeping staircase that led to the upper floors, but the floorboards creaked ominously underfoot. Strange symbols were etched into the walls, symbols none of them recognized, though they appeared to be written in some kind of ancient, forgotten language. Look at this, Emily whispered, pointing to one of the carvings. It's not Latin, and it's not any known language I've seen before. Nick scoffed. It's probably just nonsense, some lunatic scratched into the walls. I doubt it means anything. But Emily wasn't so sure. There was something deeply unsettling about the symbols, something that made her skin crawl. As they moved deeper into the manor, 
they came across a library, its shelves still filled with crumbling books. Most of them were written in old, dusty volumes of theology and the occult. In the center of the room, on a pedestal, was a thick, leather-bound tome, its pages yellowed with age. This is it, Thomas said, carefully lifting the book. This is what we've been looking for. The title, barely legible, read The Gateway of Shadows. As he opened the book, the group gathered around him. Inside were detailed accounts of rituals, sacrifices, and incantations, methods to open the Devil's Gateway. This must be what the Black Thorns were involved in, Claire murmured. They were trying to open a portal to another world. Jason, usually unfazed by such things, shivered. Maybe we should leave this stuff alone. It feels... wrong. But Thomas, ever the scholar, couldn't resist. This is why we're here. To uncover the truth. That night, they decided to stay in the manor to continue their research. But as darkness fell, the atmosphere inside the house grew heavy, oppressive. The strange symbols on the walls seemed to shift in the flickering light of their lanterns, and the temperature dropped unnaturally fast. Emily woke in the middle of the night to a sound, a deep, low rumbling, like the growl of some beast. She lay still, her heart pounding in her chest, straining to hear. It seemed to come from the basement, the part of the manor they had yet to explore. Unable to resist, she grabbed her flashlight and crept down the stairs, moving slowly to avoid waking the others. The basement door was old, its hinges rusted and nearly falling off. As she pushed it open, the smell of damp earth and something far worse hit her like a wave. The rumbling sound grew louder. With shaking hands, she descended into the basement. The air was thick with dust, but there, in the center of the room, was a stone slab covered in more of the strange carvings. But that wasn't what terrified her. In the far corner of the room, crouched in the shadows, was a figure. It was tall, impossibly thin, with long, clawed fingers and hollow, black eyes. Its face was twisted in an expression of agony, its mouth open in a silent scream. Emily gasped, dropping the flashlight. The figure moved, its head snapping in her direction. She scrambled back, her heart racing, as it began to crawl toward her, its limbs bending in unnatural angles. She ran back up the stairs, slamming the door behind her, her breath coming in ragged gasps. When she woke the others, the figure was gone. They searched the basement, but there was no sign of it. Yet Emily knew what she had seen. The next day, Thomas, intrigued by Emily's experience, decided to return to the basement. If there's something here, we need to document it, he insisted. As they descended into the cold, dark space, the air seemed to grow thicker, the oppressive feeling returning. The stone slab was at the center of the room, its carvings glowing faintly in the dim light. But this time, they noticed something they hadn't before, a trapdoor beneath the slab. With great effort, they managed to pry it open. Beneath was a dark tunnel, leading deep into the earth. Thomas, excited by the discovery, led the way. The tunnel was narrow and cramped, the walls lined with more of the strange symbols. As they descended deeper, the air grew colder, and the whispers began. At first, they were faint, barely audible, but soon they grew louder, clearer. Voices speaking in an ancient tongue, calling to them, beckoning them forward. At the end of the tunnel, they found it, the Devil's Gateway. It was a massive, circular stone door, covered in symbols and etchings, with a deep crack running through the center. From within the crack, a dark, swirling mist seeped, cold and foul-smelling. The whispers were deafening now, filling their minds with thoughts that weren't their own. We need to leave, Jason said, backing away. This is wrong. We've gone too far. But Thomas, 
mesmerized by the sight, stepped closer. This is it, he whispered. This is what the Blackthorns were protecting. Without warning, the ground beneath them began to shake. The crack in the door widened, and from within, a hand emerged, a twisted, clawed hand, black as night. It gripped the edge of the door, pulling it open. The gateway had been unlocked. From the gateway came the hollow ones, figures tall and thin, with hollow, empty eyes and mouths twisted in silent screams. They crawled from the crack, their bodies distorted, their limbs moving unnaturally. The group ran, but the creatures followed, their movements quick and jerky. They made it back. The house at the end of Hollow Lane was once grand, but now it stood abandoned, its windows dark and lifeless. Every Halloween, kids would dare each other to get close, but no one ever went inside. It was said the house had a history, one that was buried deep, beneath layers of forgotten time. No one remembered who lived there last, but everyone in town knew the story of the forgotten guest. It all started one stormy night over a century ago. The house was hosting a lavish masquerade ball. The rooms were filled with laughter, music, and candlelight as people danced and drank the night away. However, as the clock struck midnight, a strange figure appeared at the door, dressed in black from head to toe, with a mask that covered his entire face. He walked in without a word, gliding through the crowd, his presence chilling, yet no one questioned him. As the night went on, the mysterious guest moved from room to room. Wherever he went, a sense of dread followed. Guests began to feel uneasy, as if something terrible was about to happen. But they laughed it off, attributing it to the wine and the storm raging outside. It wasn't until much later that people began to notice the unsettling truth. The guest had spoken to no one, eaten nothing, and left no footprints, despite the muddy ground outside. As the night came to a close, one of the hosts, a woman named Eleanor, decided to approach him. She politely asked him to reveal himself, thinking it was some prankster trying to cause a stir. The man in black slowly removed his mask. What Eleanor saw beneath it was not a face. There was nothing but darkness, an endless void where a person's features should have been. The void seemed to pull at her, drawing her closer, but before she could scream, the man vanished, leaving only the echo of his presence. The ball ended in chaos. Guests fled the house, never to return. Eleanor was found the next morning, her hair completely white, her eyes wide and empty, as though she had seen something too terrible to comprehend. She never spoke again. Years passed, and the house fell into decay. But every year, on the anniversary of that fateful night, a single light is seen in the window. Locals whisper that it's the forgotten guest, returning for a party that never ended for him. Some say that if you enter the house on that night, you'll never leave. You'll become just another forgotten guest, trapped in the shadows, waiting for the next victim to arrive. One year, a group of teenagers decided to test the legend. Armed with flashlights and cameras, they snuck into the house on Halloween night, eager to capture something supernatural for their YouTube channel. They laughed and joked as they explored the crumbling rooms, brushing off the eerie silence that filled the house. But as midnight approached, the air grew cold, and the sound of soft footsteps echoed through the halls. The group froze, their breath visible in the chill. One of them turned toward the sound and saw a shadowy figure standing at the top of the stairs, watching them with hollow eyes. In a panic, they ran, but the doors wouldn't open. The windows wouldn't budge. The house had trapped them, just as it had trapped so many before. The last footage from their camera showed a figure in black slowly approaching, its mask glinting in the dim light. To this day, no one knows what happened to them. Their footage was found abandoned on the steps of the house the next morning, but the teens themselves were never seen again. Do you dare to visit the house on Hollow Lane? Just be careful. 
you might become the next forgotten guest. The town of Ashford had always felt like a place forgotten by time. Tucked away in the hills of a remote part of England, it was a village few people visited, and even fewer people left. The roads leading to it were rough and overgrown, and the dense forest surrounding it felt more like a wall than a natural barrier. No one could say exactly when Ashford had been founded, but everyone who lived there knew its dark history, the town was cursed, and the old church that stood at its centre was where the curse began. It was here that Thomas Green arrived, a historian and researcher of the occult. He had spent years chasing rumours of cursed places and forgotten rituals, but the whispers about Ashford had always been the most elusive. The town didn't appear on modern maps, and records of its existence were sparse, as though someone, or something, had intentionally erased it from history. But Thomas had found enough to lead him here, along with his team of researchers, Sarah, an expert in religious symbols, Marcus, a professor of ancient languages, and Emily, a skeptic who kept their feet grounded in reality. Together, they were determined to uncover the truth about Ashford and its infamous Silent Covenant. As they approached the town, a thick fog began to settle in, making the already narrow roads even more treacherous. The trees seemed to close in on them, their branches twisting unnaturally, like the skeletal fingers of a forgotten god. The village appeared suddenly, as though it had materialized from the fog itself. Small stone houses lined the dirt streets, their windows dark and lifeless. There was no sign of any inhabitants, and an unsettling silence hung over the town. This place gives me the creeps, Sarah muttered as they parked near the village centre. Are we sure anyone still lives here? Thomas nodded, though he was beginning to wonder the same thing. According to the few records I've found, there's a caretaker of the old church. That's who we're here to see. At the heart of Ashford stood the church, a massive, crumbling structure made of dark stone. Its spire, once towering and proud, now leaned at an unsettling angle, as though ready to collapse. Ivy had overtaken much of the building, its windows shattered and its doors hanging askew. Despite its dilapidated state, there was something about the church that demanded reverence, or perhaps fear. The group approached cautiously, their footsteps echoing in the unnatural silence. As they neared the entrance, an old man appeared in the doorway. His skin was pale, almost grey, and his eyes were sunken and hollow, like someone who hadn't seen sunlight in years. You're the ones who asked about the covenant, he rasped, his voice little more than a whisper. You shouldn't have come. Thomas stepped forward, showing the man his credentials. We're researchers. We've heard of the Silent Covenant and we're here to document the history of this place. The old man's lips twitched into something that might have been a smile, but it was too unsettling to tell. History, he said, his voice barely audible. There's no history here. Only death. If you're wise, you'll leave before nightfall. The group exchanged uneasy glances, but Thomas pressed on. We can't leave without understanding what happened here. The old man stared at him for a long moment before stepping aside. Very well. But you won't like what you find. Inside, the church was cold and damp, the stone walls slick with moisture. Faded murals depicting biblical scenes lined the walls, but many had been defaced or covered with strange symbols. At the front of the church was an altar, but it was unlike any altar Thomas had seen. It was made of black stone, carved with runes and symbols that Marcus couldn't immediately recognize. This isn't Christian, Marcus whispered, running his fingers over the carvings. These symbols. They're older. Much older. The old man, who had been watching them silently, finally spoke. The church was built on cursed ground. Long before Ashford was founded, this land was home to something ancient. The people here made a pact, what we now call the Silent Covenant. They called upon something dark, something beyond our understanding. 
they offered sacrifices to it in exchange for protection and prosperity. What kind of sacrifices? Sarah asked, her voice barely above a whisper. The old man's eyes gleamed in the dim light. The kind that comes from blood and bone. He gestured to the altar. This is where they made their offerings. And for a time, the town prospered. But the covenant had a price, a price that was paid with more than just lives. What happened? Thomas asked. The old man turned, his voice barely audible as he spoke. The covenant was broken. They tried to end the pact, to escape the power they had invoked. But the thing they had called upon does not forget. It does not forgive. As night fell, the group decided to stay in the church, despite the old man's warnings. He had left them with a final, cryptic message, the silent ones will come when the moon is high. And they will not be denied. The fog outside had thickened, so much so that they could no longer see the village from the church's broken windows. The only light came from their lanterns, casting long, flickering shadows on the stone walls. As the hours passed, the temperature dropped, and a strange tension filled the air. It started with the whispers. At first, they thought it was the wind, though none of them could remember hearing the wind since they had arrived. The whispers were faint, like voices carried on the breeze, too quiet to make out. But as the night wore on, they grew louder, more distinct. The voices seemed to come from everywhere at once, surrounding them, filling the church with an oppressive sense of dread. I don't like this, Emily said, her usual skepticism giving way to fear. We should leave. But when they opened the door to the church, the fog had thickened into a wall of white, impenetrable and unnatural. It was as though the village had been swallowed by it, leaving them trapped in the church. There's something out there, Sarah whispered, her eyes wide with fear. I can feel it. The whispers grew louder, and with them came something worse, figures moving in the fog. At first, they were only shadows, barely visible through the thick white mist. But as the night wore on, the figures grew more distinct. Tall, gaunt forms with long limbs and featureless faces. They moved slowly, deliberately, like they were searching for something. They're looking for us, Marcus said, his voice trembling. They're the silent ones? The old man's warning echoed in their minds, the silent ones will come when the moon is high. And they will not be denied. Desperate to understand what was happening, Thomas and Marcus returned to the altar. There had to be something they had missed, some clue to the ritual that could stop whatever was coming for them. As they examined the runes, Marcus finally made a breakthrough. This isn't just an altar, he said, his voice shaking with realization. It's a seal. The silent covenant wasn't just a pact, it was a binding spell, a way to trap whatever they had summoned. But the seal is broken, Thomas said, his heart pounding. That's why the silent ones are coming. Sarah, standing by the window, suddenly gasped. They're here. The figures had surrounded the church, their hollow eyes glowing faintly in the fog. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, filling the air with a maddening cacophony of voices. There has to be a way to fix the seal. Emily shouted, her skepticism completely shattered by the terror of the night. Marcus, frantically flipping through old notes and symbols, found something. The ritual. The townspeople tried to end the pact by breaking the seal, but there's a counter-ritual to reinforce it. We can trap them again, but we need to finish what they started. We don't have much time, Thomas warned, glancing at the silent ones, who were now pressing against the windows and doors of the church. They're getting closer. Working together, the group gathered the items needed for the ritual, candles, chalk, and blood. Marcus drew the runes on the floor around the altar, his hands shaking as the whispers grew louder, now so overwhelming that they could barely hear each other speak. 
As they began the ritual, the church trembled. The silent ones, sensing what they were trying to do, pushed harder against the walls, their clawed hands, scraping against the stone, their featureless faces pressing against the windows. We have to hurry? Sarah shouted, her voice nearly drowned out by the whispers. As Marcus spoke the final incantation, the altar began to glow with an eerie, dark light. The runes on the floor pulsed, and the church shook violently. The silent ones let out a high-pitched, inhuman wail as they were pulled back toward the altar, their forms dissolving into the mist. For a moment, it seemed like they had succeeded. The whispers stopped, and the church grew still. But as the last of the silent ones disappeared, the altar cracked, and from the fissure emerged something far worse, something. For years, Dunmore Manor stood as a crumbling relic on the outskirts of a remote Scottish village. Perched on a desolate cliff overlooking the turbulent sea, its dark, ivy-covered walls seemed to whisper forgotten stories to anyone daring enough to listen. But no one in the village went near it anymore, not since the disappearance of the entire McAllister family decades ago. The villagers claimed it was cursed, haunted by the souls of those who had perished there. Others spoke of darker things of a presence that lurked beneath the surface, waiting to be awakened. None of this deterred John and Helen Carter when they inherited the estate. To them, Dunmore Manor was a stroke of luck. After years of struggling to afford a home, they saw the inheritance from a distant relative as a blessing. The couple, along with their teenage daughter, Sophie, left their busy life in London to move into the grand, if slightly dilapidated, manner. From the moment they arrived, Helen felt uneasy. The house seemed too quiet, too empty, despite its massive size. There was a strange heaviness in the air, and even during the day, the rooms felt dark, as though the sunlight couldn't quite penetrate the thick stone walls. Sophie, however, was enchanted by the mystery of the place. She loved exploring the old rooms, discovering hidden doors and forgotten passageways. Within days, strange things began to happen. The first incident seemed innocuous. It was late at night, and Helen was the last one awake, sitting in the kitchen reading. She heard footsteps overhead, heavy, deliberate steps, moving from one end of the house to the other. At first, she assumed it was John or Sophie, but when she went upstairs to check, both were fast asleep in their beds. Puzzled, but not wanting to overreact, she returned to the kitchen, dismissing the sounds as old pipes or floorboards settling. The following night, it was Sophie who came running into her parents' room, pale and trembling. There's someone in my room, she whispered, her voice shaking. John, skeptical but protective, grabbed a flashlight and followed her back to her room. He searched every corner, every closet, but found nothing. Still, Sophie insisted that she had seen a shadowy figure standing at the foot of her bed, watching her. Over the next few days, the events grew more frequent, and impossible to ignore. Lights flickered and went out without explanation, doors opened and closed on their own, and cold drafts swept through rooms that had no windows. At night, the family heard whispering voices, too faint to make out, but too distinct to dismiss. Helen, always the rational one, tried to find explanations. The house was old, she told herself. Old houses creak and groan. Drafts and faulty wiring could explain the flickering lights and sudden chills. But deep down, she knew something was terribly wrong. It wasn't until Sophie started talking about the woman in the walls that Helen's rationality began to crack. Sophie's behavior began to change. She became withdrawn, spending hours in her room or wandering the dark hallways of the manor, as though searching for something. When Helen pressed her, Sophie would simply shrug and say, I'm talking to the woman in the walls. At first, Helen assumed it was just an imaginary friend, perhaps Sophie's way of coping with the isolation of living in such a remote place. 
but then Sophie began drawing pictures. Dark, twisted images of a woman with hollow eyes, her body twisted and contorted, emerging from the walls of the manor. Helen showed the drawings to John, but he dismissed them as nothing more than the product of an overactive imagination. She's a teenager, Helen. She's probably just bored out here. But Helen wasn't convinced. One evening, she found Sophie standing in front of one of the old fireplaces, her hand resting against the stone wall. When Helen asked her what she was doing, Sophie didn't look away from the wall as she spoke. She's here, Mum. She wants to come out. Chills ran down Helen's spine. Who? Who wants to come out? The woman in the walls, Sophie said, turning to look at her mother with unnerving calm. She's been trapped for so long. Helen pulled Sophie away from the wall, trying to keep her voice steady. There's no one in the walls, Sophie. It's just an old house. Sophie smiled, but it wasn't the kind of smile Helen had ever seen on her daughter before. It was cold, distant. You'll see, Sophie whispered. She's always watching. That night, Helen couldn't sleep. The weight of everything, the whispers, the footsteps, Sophie's behavior, pressed down on her like a physical burden. Determined to get to the bottom of it, she began searching through the old trunks and boxes left behind by the previous owners. She found old furniture, moth-eaten clothes, and stacks of yellowed papers. But in one of the boxes, hidden beneath a pile of dusty linens, she found a leather-bound journal. The journal belonged to the last owner of Dunmore Manor, Margaret McAllister, the matriarch of the family, who had mysteriously vanished all those years ago. As Helen read through the pages, the story began to unfold, a story of madness, tragedy, and something far more sinister. Margaret wrote about a woman named Eliza, a servant who had once worked at the manor. Eliza had been accused of witchcraft by the local villagers after a series of strange deaths in the town. The McAllister family, desperate to protect their name, had sealed Eliza in a hidden chamber within the walls of the manor, leaving her to die a slow, agonizing death. Margaret's final entries spoke of how she and her family had been haunted by Eliza's vengeful spirit ever since. Helen's hands trembled, as she read the final entry, the woman in the walls won't leave. She whispers to the children. She watches us. I can feel her. In the walls. Waiting. Suddenly, the strange occurrences made sense. Eliza's spirit had never left the manor. She was still there, trapped in the walls, and now she was reaching out to Sophie. The next morning, Helen confronted John with the diary, but he refused to believe her. It's just a story, he insisted. Old superstitions from a time when people believed in witches and curses. You're letting this place get to you. But Helen knew better. She could feel the presence in the house growing stronger with each passing day. The air was thick with tension, and the temperature in Sophie's room had dropped to a bone-chilling cold. The whispers had become louder, more insistent, and Sophie was slipping further and further away from them. One night, Helen woke to the sound of Sophie's voice. She wasn't in her room. Panicked, Helen rushed through the dark corridors, following the sound of her daughter's voice. She found Sophie standing in front of a blank section of the wall in the basement, her hand resting against the stone. She's here, Sophie whispered. She wants to be free. Before Helen could stop her, Sophie pressed her hand harder against the stone, and the wall began to crack. A low, guttural moan echoed through the house as the stone shifted, revealing a narrow, dark passageway. The passage was cold, damp, and smelled of decay. Helen hesitated, but Sophie walked forward without fear, as though something unseen was guiding her. Helen grabbed her daughter's arm, trying to pull her back, but Sophie's strength was unnatural. She's waiting, Sophie whispered, 
her voice distant and hollow. As they descended deeper into the passage, the walls began to close in, and the whispers grew louder. Helen could barely see in the darkness, but she could feel the presence pressing in on her, suffocating her with its malice. And then they reached the end of the passage. There, in a small, cramped chamber, was a figure. The woman in the walls. Her body was twisted and broken, her face gaunt and hollow-eyed. She was barely recognizable as human, her skin stretched tight over her bones, her fingers claw-like. But her eyes, her eyes were alive with rage and torment. Sophie reached out to her, but Helen grabbed her daughter, pulling her back. The woman let out a piercing scream, and the walls of the chamber began to shake, dust and debris raining down from the ceiling. Helen screamed for Sophie to run, and they fled back through the passage, the sound of the woman's wails following them. As they burst back into the basement, the walls began to seal themselves once again, trapping the vengeful spirit behind them. After that night, the Carters didn't stay in Dunmore Manor any longer. They packed their things and fled, leaving the cursed house behind. But the events of that night haunted them. Sophie, though safe, had changed. She rarely spoke of what she had seen, but Helen could see the fear in her daughter's eyes, the way she flinched at shadows and refused to go near the walls. Dunmore Manor still stands, empty and abandoned, a dark shadow over the cliff. The villagers still whisper about the woman in the walls, of the cursed family that had once lived there, and of the new family that had dared. Black Hollow was a small, quiet town, nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains. Surrounded by thick woods and high ridges, it was a place where time seemed to stand still. The people of Black Hollow liked it that way, far from the noise and chaos of the outside world. They had their routines, their traditions and most of all, their isolation. For decades, there had been stories passed down about strange lights that sometimes appeared in the night sky. The older folks would whisper about it at the local diner, and the younger generation would laugh it off as wild tales from a time before electricity. But to some, the lights were no laughing matter. They were a warning, a sign that something was out there, watching. Tommy Carson had grown up hearing those stories. His grandfather used to talk about the visitors' strange figures that would come down from the sky, leaving behind mutilated cattle and strange symbols burned into the fields. Tommy never believed him, chalking it up to the ramblings of an old man. But now, years later, as he returned to Black Hollow for his grandfather's funeral, he couldn't help but think of those stories. The town hadn't changed much since Tommy left for college. The same old houses lined the streets, the same people waved from their porches, and the same mountains loomed in the distance. But something felt. Off. The air was thicker, heavier. The sky seemed too wide, too empty, as though it was waiting for something. It was late on the third night after the funeral when Tommy first saw the lights. He had been staying in his grandfather's old house, a small cabin on the edge of town, surrounded by dense woods. The night was cool, and the sky was clear, filled with stars. Tommy had been sitting on the porch, a beer in his hand, when he noticed something strange, three bright lights hovering in the distance, just over the ridge that bordered the town. They were too bright to be stars, and they didn't move like planes or helicopters. They just floated there, in complete silence. At first, he thought his eyes were playing tricks on him. But when the lights began to move, slowly at first, then darting in impossible patterns across the sky, his heart began to race. He scrambled for his phone, trying to record the lights, but the screen remained dark. No signal? No battery? Nothing. The lights grew brighter, and a low hum filled the air, a sound that Tommy felt deep in his bones. It was unnatural, like the growl of some massive machine or the rumble of the earth before a quake. 
And then, just as suddenly as they had appeared, the lights blinked out, leaving the sky dark and silent once more. Tommy sat there for what felt like hours, his mind racing. What had he just seen? Was this what his grandfather had been talking about all those years? The lights. The visitors. The next day, Tommy couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The people in town seemed different, quieter, more reserved. No one mentioned the lights. No one talked about the strange hum in the air. When Tommy tried to bring it up with a few old friends, they just shook their heads and changed the subject. But Tommy couldn't let it go. He needed answers. Tommy began digging through his grandfather's old belongings, searching for anything that might explain the strange events he had witnessed. In the attic, among dusty boxes of old tools and family heirlooms, he found a leather-bound journal. It was his grandfather's handwriting, though the entries were far from the ramblings of an old man. They were detailed accounts of sightings, encounters, and strange occurrences that had plagued Black Hollow for generations. His grandfather had kept meticulous records of the lights, every time they appeared, where they hovered, and the strange phenomena that followed. Dead animals found mutilated in the fields, strange symbols carved into trees, and, most disturbing of all, people who had gone missing, vanished without a trace after the lights appeared. The journal described something even more chilling, strange figures seen in the woods, tall and thin with glowing eyes, moving silently through the trees. His grandfather called them the Watchers, and he believed they were responsible for the disappearances. The last few entries were written in shaky handwriting, filled with fear and desperation. His grandfather had become convinced that the Watchers were after him, that they were coming for him because he knew too much. The final entry, dated two days before his death, simply read, They are here. A chill ran down Tommy's spine as he read the words. He had always believed his grandfather had died of natural causes, an old man's heart finally giving out. But now, he wasn't so sure? That night, Tommy decided to visit the ridge where he had seen the lights. He needed to know if they were real or if his mind was playing tricks on him. The woods around Black Hollow were dense and foreboding, especially at night. The trees seemed to close in around him as Tommy made his way up the ridge, his flashlight cutting through the darkness. The air was unnaturally still, and every crack of a twig or rustle of leaves set his nerves on edge. As he reached the top of the ridge, he saw it, an area of scorched earth, as if something massive had landed there. The ground was blackened, and the trees around the clearing were twisted and burned. In the center of the clearing, he found something that made his blood run cold, a large, circular imprint, perfectly smooth, with strange symbols carved into the ground around it. They matched the symbols his grandfather had drawn in his journal. And then, the hum returned. It started as a low vibration, barely noticeable, but quickly grew louder, shaking the ground beneath Tommy's feet. He looked up just in time to see the lights, three bright orbs hovering in the sky, directly above him. They moved in perfect unison, circling the clearing with impossible speed. Panic set in. Tommy turned and ran, crashing through the underbrush, his heart pounding in his chest. But no matter how fast he ran, the hum followed him, growing louder and more intense until it felt like his head was about to split open. He could feel the lights behind him, closing in, surrounding him. Suddenly, everything went silent. The hum stopped, the lights vanished, and Tommy was left standing alone in the woods, gasping for breath. It was as if the world had been reset, everything eerily calm, as though nothing had happened. But something had happened. Tommy knew it. The next morning, Tommy tried to talk to the sheriff. He explained what he had seen, showed him the journal, and described the strange symbols on the ridge. But the sheriff barely listened, dismissing his concerns with a wave of his hand. 
We don't talk about those things around here, the sheriff said gruffly. You should do the same. Frustrated and scared, Tommy decided to leave Black Hollow. He packed his bags, ready to put the town and its dark secrets behind him. But when he tried to leave, his car wouldn't start. The engine was dead, as though the battery had been drained completely. Even the gas station attendant seemed uninterested in helping him, muttering something about how the hollow takes care of its own. That night, as Tommy lay in bed, he heard something outside his window, a soft tapping, like fingernails gently scraping against the glass. He froze, fear gripping him. Slowly, he turned to look. Standing outside his window, bathed in the pale moonlight, was a figure. It was tall and impossibly thin, its limbs too long, its eyes glowing faintly in the dark. It watched him, its face featureless but somehow filled with malevolent intent. Tommy scrambled out of bed, grabbed his phone, and ran to the door. But as soon as he opened it, he stopped in his tracks. Standing in the doorway, blocking his escape, were two more figures, identical to the one outside his window. They didn't move. They didn't speak. They just watched. The next morning, Tommy was gone. His car was still parked outside his grandfather's house. His belongings were still in the cabin. But there was no sign of him. The townspeople didn't seem surprised. They had seen this before. Another person, gone without a trace, taken by the lights. In the weeks that followed, a few people from neighboring towns came looking for Tommy, but no one could give them any answers. His disappearance became just another mystery in the long, dark history of Black Hollow. And still, on quiet nights, the lights would return, hovering over the ridge, casting their eerie glow over the town. The people of Black Hollow had learned to ignore them, to turn a blind eye to the strange hum that sometimes filled the air. They knew the truth, but they also knew better than to speak of it. The visitors were always watching, waiting. And one by one, the people who dared to ask too many questions would disappear, swallowed by the silence of the lights. Years passed, and Black Hollow remained as isolated as ever, its secrets buried beneath layers of fear and silence. But every once in a while, a new face would arrive in town, someone curious, someone looking for answers. And when the lights appeared in the sky, the townspeople would look up, knowing that another soul would soon vanish into the night. Black Hollow had its secrets, and the lights would ensure those secrets were never revealed. Because in Black Hollow, the sky was never empty. And the visitors never left. Evan Harris had always loved trains. As a child, he would spend hours sitting by the tracks near his home, watching the locomotives thunder by, their whistles echoing through the countryside. As an adult, his fascination only grew. He became a railway enthusiast, collecting old timetables, reading about forgotten routes, and even traveling across Europe on the continent's most famous trains. So, when an invitation arrived in his inbox to take part in an exclusive midnight train journey on a forgotten line, he couldn't resist. The email was vague but intriguing. The journey, it said, would take place on the Midnight Express, a train that ran only once a year on a hidden railway line in the Scottish Highlands. The train's history was shrouded in mystery, its passengers carefully selected. According to legend, the Midnight Express was known to take travelers on an unforgettable journey, though few details were provided. Evan, intrigued by the secrecy, accepted the invitation without hesitation. His ticket arrived in a sleek black envelope, bearing only the train's name and departure time, midnight. The instructions told him to board at a station he had never heard of before, Stirling Vale Station, which, according to his research, hadn't been operational in over fifty years. Evan arrived at Stirling Vale Station just before midnight. The place was eerie, shrouded in mist that curled around the abandoned platforms like a living thing. 
The station itself was in a state of disrepair, its windows cracked, the once grand clock tower rusted and frozen in time. Yet there was something timeless about it, as though it existed outside the world he knew. There were no other passengers in sight. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the faint rustle of the wind through the trees. Evan checked his watch, 11.50 p.m. The train was due to arrive in ten minutes. But as he waited, a strange sense of unease began to settle over him. There was something wrong about the place. It felt forgotten, like the remnants of a dream that had long since turned into a nightmare. The fog thickened, and suddenly, from the distance, came the sound of a train whistle. Low, mournful, and echoing through the cold night air. Moments later, the train emerged from the mist, a hulking black locomotive, its windows darkened, its metal exterior gleaming in the moonlight. It rolled to a stop in front of him, but no conductor appeared, no announcement was made. The doors slid open silently, as though the train had been waiting just for him. Evan hesitated. But then, Remembering the excitement he had felt upon receiving the invitation, he stepped aboard. Inside, the train was a picture of luxury. Polished wood paneling, plush velvet seats, and ornate chandeliers that swayed gently with the movement of the train. But there was something strange, it was empty. No other passengers. No staff. Just the soft hum of the engine and the rhythmic clatter of the wheels on the tracks. Evan made his way down the corridor, peeking into the other compartments, but they were all the same, empty. He finally chose a compartment near the rear of the train, settling into one of the seats by the window. The train began to move, its smooth glide almost imperceptible at first, but soon it picked up speed, racing through the darkened countryside. Outside, the landscape seemed to blur, the moonlit hills and trees blending into one another. Evan watched the world pass by, his initial unease slowly replaced by curiosity. There was something mesmerizing about the speed, the solitude, the strange otherworldly atmosphere. But after an hour, he noticed something unsettling. The view outside hadn't changed. It was as though the train was moving in circles, passing the same hills, the same trees, over and over again. He frowned, leaning closer to the window, and then he saw it, standing on a hill, silhouetted against the moonlight, was a figure. It was there for only a moment, and then it was gone as the train sped past. But Evan couldn't shake the feeling that the figure had been watching him. Suddenly, the train began to slow. There was no station, no platform, just an open field shrouded in fog. The train came to a stop, and for a few moments, nothing happened. Evan waited, but no passengers boarded. The doors slid open, and the cold night air rushed in, carrying with it a faint whispering sound, like voices carried on the wind. Curiosity got the better of him, and Evan stepped out onto the platform. The fog was thick, obscuring his vision, but he could see something in the distance, dark shapes moving slowly through the mist. He squinted, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. The shapes were people. Or at least, they looked like people. They were shrouded in dark cloaks, their faces hidden beneath hoods. They moved slowly, silently, as though in a trance, drifting toward the train. But something about them was wrong. Their movements were too stiff, too unnatural, like puppets on invisible strings. Suddenly, one of the figures turned toward him, its hood slipping back to reveal a face. Or rather, what should have been a face. There was nothing there, just darkness, an empty void where a face should be. The figure raised a hand, beckoning to him. Panic surged through Evan. He scrambled back onto the train, his heart pounding. The doors slid shut behind him, and the train began to move again, picking up speed as it left the strange figures behind. As the train raced through the night, Evan returned to his compartment, 
trying to make sense of what he had just seen. The empty, faceless figures, the strange fog, the unnatural silence, it all felt like a nightmare. But when he looked around the compartment, he realized he was no longer alone. There were passengers now, seated in the compartments along the corridor. At first, Evan felt a sense of relief. But as he passed by the windows of the compartments, he realized something was terribly wrong. The passengers were all staring straight ahead, their faces blank, their eyes wide and unblinking. They didn't move. They didn't speak. They simply sat there, like wax figures in a museum. Evan moved slowly through the train, his heart pounding in his chest. Every compartment was the same, rows of passengers, all frozen in place, as though waiting for something. And then, as he passed by one of the compartments, he saw something that made his blood run cold. One of the passengers turned its head to look at him. It was a slow, deliberate movement, the figure's face twisting toward him with a grotesque creak of joints. The eyes, glassy and lifeless, locked onto his, and the figure slowly raised a hand, pointing down the corridor. Evan backed away, his breath coming in ragged gasps. He didn't know where to go or what to do. The train was no longer a sanctuary, it was a trap, a moving prison. Desperate, he ran back to his compartment, slamming the door behind him. Just as Evan thought he couldn't take any more, the door to his compartment slid open. Standing there was a man dressed in a conductor's uniform, his expression calm, almost serene. Mr. Harris, the conductor said, his voice low and measured. I see you've met the passengers. Evan stared at him, struggling to form words. What? What is happening? Who are they? The conductor stepped into the compartment, closing the door behind him. The passengers are the souls of the lost, Mr. Harris. People who have boarded this train over the years, seeking something they cannot find. Once you board the Midnight Express, your journey has begun, and there is no turning back. What do you mean, no turning back? Evan demanded. This is insane. Let me off this train. The conductor's eyes darkened, and he shook his head. I'm afraid it's not that simple. The Midnight Express does not take you where you want to go, Mr. Harris. It takes you where you are meant to go. Evan felt a chill creep over him. And where am I meant to go? The conductor's face remained impassive, but his voice held a note of finality. That remains to be seen. The train continued to race through the night, faster and faster, the landscape outside warping into a blur of shadows and light. The passengers remained motionless, their dead eyes staring into nothingness. Evan could feel the walls of the train closing in on him, the air growing thinner, colder. He had to escape, but how? There was no way off this train. Suddenly, the train began to slow again. This time, there was no station, no fog. Just a yawning darkness that seemed to swallow everything. The train came to a stop, and the conductor stood in the doorway of Evan's compartment, his expression grave. It's time, Mr. Harris, the conductor said. This is your stop. Evan shook his head, backing away. No. I'm not getting off. I'm not staying on this train any longer. The conductor stepped aside, and the compartment door slid open. Beyond the door was only darkness, endless, impenetrable darkness. But from within that darkness, Evan could hear something. A low, guttural whispering, like voices calling his name. The passengers began to stir. Slowly, they turned their heads toward the open door, their dead eyes fixed on Evan. You must go, Mr. Harris, the conductor urged. This is your destination. Evan felt himself being pulled toward the door, as though an invisible force was dragging him into the void. The whispering grew louder, more insistent, 
filling his mind with a cacophony of voices. No! Evan screamed, struggling against the pull. I won't go! But it was too late. The darkness swallowed him whole. When the train pulled into Stirling Vale Station the next night, there was no sign of Evan Harris. The Midnight Express, as always, arrived in perfect silence, its doors opening to admit a new passenger, a young woman, clutching her ticket nervously in her hand. She stepped aboard, glancing around at the empty train, unaware of the eyes watching her from the shadows. The conductor smiled, welcoming her with a slight nod. Welcome aboard the Midnight Express, he said. Your journey is about to begin. And as the train pulled away from the station, disappearing into the fog, the passengers watched silently, their faces blank, their eyes empty. For they knew what the young woman did not, that once you board the Midnight Express, you never truly leave. It was supposed to be the perfect getaway. Six friends, Mike, Sarah, Jake, Emily, Chris, and Lauren, had been planning this camping trip for months. They had grown up together, bonded over their love of adventure and the outdoors, and now, with the stresses of adulthood weighing on them, a weekend in the wilderness seemed like the perfect escape. They chose a spot deep in the Cascade Mountains, a remote and untouched area known for its beauty and isolation. It was miles from the nearest town, and the only way to access it was by hiking through dense forest for nearly a day. The plan was simple, two nights of camping, hiking, and roasting marshmallows by the fire, far from cell service and the demands of everyday life. Mike had found the location after hearing about it from an old outdoorsman he'd met in a small mountain town. The man had told him of a hidden valley, so secluded that few ever ventured there. It sounded perfect, exactly what they were looking for. As they packed up their gear and headed into the forest, spirits were high. The trail was rough, winding through thick trees and along narrow ridges, but the group was used to tough hikes. They laughed, joked, and talked about how nice it would be to get away from everything for a while. But as they ventured deeper into the wilderness, the forest began to change. The trees grew taller and denser, their branches twisting in unnatural ways. The air felt heavier, and the sounds of wildlife that had been constant, birds, insects, the occasional rustle of small animals, faded away, leaving only the soft crunch of their boots on the forest floor. The sky, once bright with afternoon sun, seemed darker, the canopy above blotting out much of the light. Kind of eerie, isn't it? Sarah said with a nervous laugh, trying to break the growing silence. Mike shrugged it off. That's the whole point, right? Getting away from it all. But deep down, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. By late afternoon, they arrived at their destination, a wide clearing surrounded by towering trees, with a crystal clear stream running through the middle. It was beautiful, but there was something about the place that felt off. The air was unnaturally still, and the silence was oppressive. Well, this is it, Mike said, dropping his pack and stretching. Let's get camp set up. The group worked quickly, setting up tents, gathering firewood, and unpacking their supplies. Despite the growing unease in the air, they managed to laugh and joke, their excitement for the weekend overshadowing their discomfort. As night fell, they gathered around the campfire, the flames crackling and casting flickering shadows on the surrounding trees. They roasted marshmallows, told stories, and enjoyed the tranquility that only the deep wilderness could offer. But as the evening wore on, the atmosphere began to change. The shadows around them grew darker, deeper, and the silence became unnerving. Even the crackling of the fire seemed muted, as though the forest was absorbing the sound. It was Lauren who first noticed the figures. She had been staring into the trees, lost in thought, when she saw movement, something shifting in the darkness just beyond the fire's light. At first, she thought it was an animal, 
but then she realized the shapes were too tall, too thin. She blinked, thinking her eyes were playing tricks on her, but when she looked again, the figures were still there, standing perfectly still, watching. There's something out there, Lauren whispered, her voice trembling. The others turned to look, but by the time they did, the figures were gone. Probably just a deer or something, Jake said, trying to sound confident, though his voice wavered slightly. Yeah, nothing to worry about, Mike added, though he, too, couldn't shake the feeling that they were being watched. That night, the forest seemed to come alive with strange noises. It started with a low humming sound, barely audible at first, like the distant rumble of machinery. Then came the whispers, soft, indistinct voices carried on the wind, too quiet to make out, but persistent enough to keep them awake. Jake, always the rational one, insisted it was just the wind, the sounds of the forest. But as the hours passed, the noises grew louder, more distinct. It was as if something, or someone, was moving through the trees, circling the camp, just beyond the reach of their flashlights. Around 2 a.m., Chris heard it, the distinct snap of a branch, followed by a low, guttural growl. He sat bolt upright in his sleeping bag, heart pounding. He strained to listen, but all he could hear was the rapid thudding of his own pulse. Did you hear that? He whispered, nudging Mike awake. Mike sat up, rubbing his eyes. What is it? There's something out there, Chris said, his voice shaking. I heard it. Mike listened for a moment but heard nothing. Probably just an animal, he said, trying to sound reassuring, though his own nerves were on edge. But deep down, Chris knew it wasn't an animal. Whatever had made that sound wasn't natural. The next morning, they found footprints. At first, they thought they were human, large, barefoot prints in the soft dirt near the edge of the camp. But as they examined them more closely, they realized something was wrong. The prints were too long, too narrow, with deep claw marks at the toes. What the hell made these? Sarah asked, her voice filled with unease. No one had an answer. Despite the unsettling events of the previous night, the group decided to stay. After all, they had hiked for hours to reach this spot, and they weren't about to let some strange noises and footprints ruin their weekend. But as the day wore on, the feeling of unease only grew stronger. By late afternoon, Emily, who had been quiet and withdrawn since they arrived, announced that she needed some time alone. She grabbed a water bottle, and headed off into the woods, saying she just wanted to explore a little and clear her head. Hours passed, and Emily didn't return. By sunset, the group was growing worried. Mike and Jake decided to go looking for her, grabbing their flashlights and heading in the direction she had gone. They called her name, their voices echoing through the trees, but there was no response. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. After an hour of searching, they found her water bottle, lying in the middle of a small clearing. There was no sign of Emily, but there was something else, something that made their blood run cold. Carved into the trees around the clearing were strange symbols, unfamiliar and unsettling. They were crude, almost primitive, and seemed to pulse with a malevolent energy. What the hell is this? Jake whispered, his voice barely audible. I don't know, Mike replied, his heart racing. But we need to get back to camp. Now. They returned to the campsite, their minds racing with fear and confusion. The others were waiting, their faces pale with worry. We couldn't find her, Mike said, his voice hollow. She's gone. That night, the whispers returned, louder and more insistent. The fire flickered and dimmed, as though the forest itself was sucking the light from it. The air grew cold, unnaturally so, and the strange humming sound returned, vibrating through the ground beneath them. 
one by one, the group's flashlights flickered and died, leaving them in near total darkness. The only light came from the dimming fire, casting long, distorted shadows on the trees. Then they heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, moving toward them from all directions. Who's there? Jake shouted, his voice trembling. No response? Only the footsteps, growing closer. Suddenly, the figures appeared again, stepping out from the shadows, their forms tall and twisted. They were human-like, but wrong in every way. Their limbs were too long, their faces featureless, as if carved from the very darkness itself. The group scrambled to their feet, backing away toward the fire. What the hell are they? Sarah whispered, her voice shaking with terror. No one answered. The figures moved closer, their footsteps unnervingly slow, as though they had all the time in the world. We need to get out of here, Mike said, his voice filled with urgency. They grabbed what little gear they could and ran, crashing through the underbrush, their hearts pounding in their chests. The figures followed, always just out of reach, moving silently through the trees. As they ran, the forest seemed to close in around them. The trees twisted and shifted, blocking their path, forcing them deeper into the woods. No matter which direction they turned, they found themselves back at the same spot, the clearing with the strange symbols carved into the trees. It was as if the forest itself was trapping them, refusing to let them leave. By the time they returned to the campsite, they were exhausted and terrified. Emily was still missing, and whatever had taken her was now after them. They huddled together around the fire, their faces pale with fear. We have to leave, Lauren said, her voice trembling. We have to find a way out of here. We've tried, Mike replied, his voice hollow. The forest. It's not letting us go. The fire flickered again, and the air grew colder. The whispers returned, louder than ever, filling their ears with unintelligible voices, a maddening chorus of fear and confusion. Suddenly, the figures appeared again, stepping out of the trees, closer this time. Their featureless faces seemed to watch the group, their long, twisted limbs moving unnaturally as they approached. What do you want? Chris shouted, his voice breaking with fear. The figures said nothing. They only moved closer. One by one, the fire died, the darkness closing in around them. The figures were nearly upon them now, their presence oppressive, suffocating. And then, just as the last embers of the fire flickered out, a voice, soft, but clear, whispered through the darkness. You are ours now. The next morning, a search party was sent into the forest to find the missing campers. They had been reported missing when they failed to return after the weekend. The searchers combed through the dense woods, calling their names, but there was no trace of them. When they reached the campsite, they found the remains of a fire, scattered gear, and tents, but no sign of the six friends. It was as if they had simply vanished. There were no footprints, no signs of a struggle, only the silence of the forest, and the strange symbols carved into the trees. The search party returned to the town, baffled and unsettled. Over the years, more people would disappear in that same forest, and the legend of the forest of no return would grow. The locals would tell stories of the strange figures that lived in the woods, the ones who watched, waiting for those foolish enough to venture too deep. And though the truth was never discovered, the forest remained, dark and silent, keeping its secrets hidden in the shadows, waiting for the next group of campers to wander into its depths. The forest never let them leave. It was supposed to be the perfect weekend. Five friends, Nick, Laura, Jess, Adam, and Will, had been planning their camping trip for months. They had all met during their first year of university, and ever since, they'd made it a tradition to reconnect each year with an adventure in the wilderness. 
This time, they chose the remote Pine Ridge National Park, a secluded area known for its towering pine trees and crystal clear lakes. Far from cell towers and the stresses of city life, Pine Ridge offered a chance to disconnect and unwind. Nick had heard about the place from a colleague at work. He mentioned an off-trail campsite, a clearing near an old lake deep within the park, rarely visited by other campers. It sounded perfect for their group, isolated, peaceful, and untouched by civilization. They arrived at Pine Ridge on a sunny Friday afternoon. Spirits were high as they parked their cars at the entrance, strapped on their backpacks, and started the long hike into the forest. The trail was rugged, winding through dense clusters of trees, but the group was in good spirits, laughing and joking as they made their way deeper into the woods. The air was fresh, and the sound of birds and rustling leaves made them feel truly free. By late afternoon, they reached their destination, a wide, open clearing surrounded by towering pine trees, with a small, still lake at its center. The sun hung low in the sky, casting a golden glow over the water. It was beautiful, just what they had hoped for. This is perfect, Laura said, dropping her pack on the ground. I can't believe how peaceful it is. Nick grinned. Told you guys this would be the spot. No one to bother us for miles. The group quickly set up camp, pitching their tents and gathering wood for a fire. They were all experienced campers, so everything went smoothly. By the time the sun had set, they were gathered around a crackling fire, toasting marshmallows and passing around a flask of whiskey. The conversation was easy, flowing as it always did when they were together. But as the night deepened, a strange sense of unease began to settle over the group, though none of them wanted to admit it at first. It was sometime after midnight when the feeling of being watched crept into the camp. The fire had burned down to glowing embers, and the only sound was the occasional crackle of the wood and the rustling of the wind through the trees. Laura was the first to notice something strange. Do you hear that? She asked, her voice soft but tense. The others stopped talking and listened. For a moment, there was nothing but silence. Then, faintly, they all heard it, a low, almost imperceptible whispering, carried on the breeze. It was too faint to make out any words, but it was there, just on the edge of hearing. Probably just the wind, Will said, though his voice lacked confidence. Wind doesn't sound like that, Jess replied, her eyes scanning the dark woods around them. They all stared into the shadows beyond the fire's light, but there was nothing to see. Just the dense forest, the towering pines swaying gently in the breeze. Let's call it a night, Nick suggested, trying to ease the tension. We've got a long hike tomorrow. The others reluctantly agreed, and one by one, they retreated to their tents. But the unease lingered. As Laura crawled into her sleeping bag, she couldn't shake the feeling that they were being watched. She lay there in the dark, listening for any sound, but all she heard was the soft breathing of her friends and the occasional rustle of the trees outside. Sometime in the early hours of the morning, just as she was beginning to drift off, she heard it again, the whispering. Louder this time, closer. She sat up, her heart pounding in her chest, straining to hear. The whispers were definitely there, faint but distinct, and they seemed to be coming from just outside her tent. Her pulse quickened. She grabbed her flashlight, unzipped the tent, and shined the beam outside. There was nothing. The trees stood silent and still, the fire long since died out. But the whispering. It had been real. She was sure of it. The next morning, the group awoke to a bright, cloudless sky. The unease of the previous night seemed to fade with the daylight, and everyone was eager to start their hike to a nearby ridge that Nick had read about. After a quick breakfast, they packed up some gear and set off. But as they were leaving, Adam noticed something strange by the edge of the campsite. Guys, come look at this. 
the group gathered around him, staring at the ground. There, in the soft dirt, were a set of footprints, large, human-like prints. But they were off. The toes were elongated, almost claw-like, and the spacing between each step was unnaturally wide. Who would be out here? Jess asked, her brow furrowed. We're miles from any trail. And why would they be barefoot? Nick added, kneeling to inspect the prints more closely. Maybe it's some kind of animal, Will suggested, though he didn't sound convinced. Adam shook his head. No way. This is a person's print, or something like it. The group exchanged uneasy glances, but no one had an answer. Finally, Nick stood up and forced a smile. Let's not overthink it. Probably just a weird hiker or something. Come on, we've got a ridge to climb. Reluctantly, the others agreed, though the strange footprints stayed in the back of their minds as they made their way up the trail. The hike was beautiful, with sweeping views of the surrounding mountains, and for a while, they managed to forget about the oddities of the morning. But as the day wore on, the feeling of being watched returned. Jess, who was hiking at the back of the group, kept glancing over her shoulder, convinced she saw something moving between the trees. Each time she looked, there was nothing, just the silent forest. That evening, the group returned to camp exhausted but satisfied. They had reached the ridge, taken photos, and enjoyed a long lunch by the cliffs. Now, all they wanted to do was relax by the fire and enjoy another peaceful night under the stars. But as the sun began to set, the unease returned, stronger than before. The forest around them seemed darker, the trees casting long, jagged shadows that stretched toward the campsite. The wind picked up, carrying with it that faint, whispering sound again, so soft it was almost impossible to tell if it was real or just their imaginations. The group tried to distract themselves by talking and laughing, but the mood had changed. Jess was quiet, staring into the woods, her fingers nervously fidgeting with the edge of her jacket. Finally, she spoke up. I think we should leave tomorrow. The others turned to her, surprised. What? Nick asked. Why? We've still got another night. Jess shook her head. Something isn't right here. I keep seeing. Things. Shadows, maybe. I don't know. But I've had this bad feeling ever since last night. Me too, Laura admitted, her voice low. I heard something outside my tent in the middle of the night. Like whispering. I thought it was just the wind, but. Now I'm not so sure. Adam frowned. You guys are freaking yourselves out. It's just a quiet forest. We're alone out here. Are we? Jess asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Before anyone could respond, there was a loud crack, a branch snapping, echoing through the trees. Everyone froze, eyes wide, staring into the darkness. Okay, that wasn't the wind, Will muttered, standing up and grabbing his flashlight. Who's out there? He shined the light into the trees, but the beam revealed nothing. The shadows seemed to shift, but there was no movement, no sign of anyone or anything. Let's go check it out, Nick said, grabbing his own flashlight. Reluctantly, the group followed, stepping cautiously into the woods. The forest was eerily silent, the only sound the crunch of leaves beneath their boots. They moved slowly, scanning the trees, but there was nothing, just the dark, twisting branches overhead. Then, suddenly, Adam stopped, his flashlight illuminating something on the ground. Another set of footprints, even larger and more distorted than the ones they had seen earlier. These weren't here this morning, he said, his voice tense. And they're fresh? Before anyone could react, 
Laura let out a gasp, her flashlight catching movement in the corner of her eye. There! She whispered urgently, pointing into the trees. They all turned, but there was nothing there. Just shadows. I swear I saw something, Laura insisted, her voice trembling. We need to get back to camp, Jess said, her voice shaking with fear. Now. The group hurried back to camp, their nerves on edge. When they reached the clearing, everything seemed normal, the fire was still burning, their tents were untouched. But the sense of being watched had grown unbearable. We need to leave first thing in the morning, Nick said, his voice tight. This is getting too weird. Everyone agreed, but none of them felt safe sleeping. They stayed by the fire as long as they could, keeping watch, but eventually, exhaustion took over, and one by one, they retreated to their tents. The night passed in uneasy silence. Then, just before dawn, Laura woke to a sound, a soft rustling outside her tent. Her heart pounded in her chest as she listened, holding her breath. The sound grew louder, closer, like someone, or something, was moving just outside. She sat up, grabbing her flashlight and unzipping the tent. The moment she stepped outside, the rustling stopped. The fire was out, the clearing bathed in the pale light of the approaching dawn. She looked around, her breath fogging in the cold air. Then she saw it, another set of footprints, leading from her tent into the trees. Large, clawed, and unlike anything she had ever seen before. Panic surged through her. Guys! She shouted, running to Nick's tent. Wake up! Something's out here. But when she pulled open the tent flap, Nick was gone. His sleeping bag was empty, his gear still neatly packed beside him. There was no sign of a struggle, just the footprints, leading away from camp. One by one, she checked the others' tents. Adam was gone. Will, too. Only Jess remained, her face pale and terrified as she stepped out of her tent, her eyes wide with fear. Where are they? Jess whispered, her voice shaking. They're gone, Laura said, her own voice trembling. We have to get out of here. Laura and Jess quickly gathered what little they could carry and started running, following the trail back through the woods. The sun was rising, but the forest remained dark, the shadows long and menacing. As they ran, the whispering returned, louder now, more insistent. It was all around them, echoing through the trees, as though the forest itself was alive with voices. And always, just out of sight, they sensed something following them, something moving through the shadows watching, waiting. They didn't stop. They couldn't. The forest seemed to stretch on forever, the trail twisting and turning, leading them deeper into the woods. Their breath came in ragged gasps, their legs burning with exhaustion, but they kept running. Finally, just when they thought they couldn't go any further, they burst out of the trees and into the open parking area where their cars were parked. Relief flooded through them as they raced to the car, fumbling with the keys. As they sped down the mountain road, Laura glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see something chasing them. But there was nothing. Just the dark, silent forest, receding behind them. In the days that followed, search parties were sent into Pine Ridge National Park to look for Nick, Adam, and Will. The authorities combed through the forest, but no trace of the missing campers was ever found. It was as if they had simply vanished. Laura and Jess tried to explain what had happened, the strange whispers, the footprints, the feeling of being watched, but no one believed them. The official report labeled the disappearances as accidents, perhaps caused by a fall or animal attack. But Laura and Jess knew the truth. Something was out there in those woods. Something ancient, something that didn't want them to leave. And now, as Laura lay awake at night, she could still hear the whispers, 
faint but unmistakable, as though the forest was calling her back. The forest of Pine Ridge never forgets. It was a small coastal town, perched on the edge of a jagged cliff. Locals called it Greyhaven, where the sea constantly crashed against the rocks below, and a thick, unnatural fog rolled in every evening, hiding more than just the horizon. There was something different about tonight, though. The fog was thicker, almost alive, clinging to everything like icy fingers. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an orange glow through the mist, the town's streets fell silent. No one dared go out after dusk. No one except Emma. Emma was new in town, a skeptic who had moved to Greyhaven after inheriting a crumbling Victorian house from a distant relative she'd never met. The locals had warned her, told her about the things they'd seen in the fog, shadowy figures, whispers in the air that didn't belong to any living soul, but she dismissed it all. Superstitions, she thought. Stories to scare newcomers. Tonight, she decided to explore. The fog, so thick it swallowed sound, brushed against her skin like a cold breath as she made her way toward the old lighthouse at the edge of town. Its beam cut through the gloom, but there was something off about it, the way it flickered, almost as if it was struggling against the dark. She reached the base of the lighthouse, a relic of another time. The metal door was slightly ajar, creaking as she pushed it open. Inside, the air was damp and cold. Every step she took echoed into the void. Up the spiral staircase, she climbed, her footsteps blending with the distant, rhythmic crash of the ocean below. But halfway up, she paused. There it was, the whispering. At first, she thought it was the wind pushing through the cracks in the stone, but no. The sound was too deliberate, too close. She strained to listen, heart racing, as the voices seemed to weave through the air, circling her. Come closer, they beckoned, voices barely audible but unmistakably human, or something pretending to be. A shiver ran down her spine. She kept moving, faster now, each step more frantic than the last. As she neared the top, she saw it, the figure standing in the shadows just beyond the reach of the lighthouse's light. It was tall, its face obscured by the fog, but its eyes. Oh, those eyes gleamed through the mist, reflecting the faint light like a predator in the night. Who are you? She demanded, her voice trembling. The figure didn't move. It just stared. In a panic, Emma backed away, her foot slipping on the wet stone. She stumbled down the stairs, heart hammering in her chest, the whispers now louder, more insistent, surrounding her from all sides. You shouldn't have come. They seemed to say. You'll never leave. She burst out of the lighthouse, slamming the door behind her, but the fog had grown thicker. The town was gone, swallowed by the mist. Panic set in as she turned in circles, trying to find her way back. But every direction led her nowhere, just more fog, more whispers. That's when she heard the footsteps behind her. Slow. Deliberate. The crunch of gravel beneath heavy boots. She turned, and there it was. The figure, standing just a few feet away now, its face still hidden, its eyes glowing faintly in the dark. It reached out a hand, and the air around her grew cold, too cold to breathe. Emma ran, but no matter how fast she moved, the fog seemed to pull her back, its whispers growing louder until they drowned out her own thoughts. She could feel them now, the figures in the mist, circling her like vultures waiting for her to fall. But she didn't fall. Instead, she froze. In front of her stood a mirror, an old, ornate thing that hadn't been there before. And in the reflection, she didn't see herself. She saw the figure. Its eyes locked with hers through the glass, and slowly, ever so slowly, it began to smile. As the fog closed in, Emma reached out to touch the mirror, desperate for something real. 
but the moment her fingers brushed the cold glass, the world around her dissolved into shadow, and the whispers grew deafening. The next morning, the fog lifted as it always did. The townspeople went about their day as if nothing had happened. But Emma was gone. Her house stood empty, the windows dark. Some say, if you listen carefully on foggy nights, you can still hear her voice, lost, echoing through the mist, just another whisper in Greyhaven. But no one ever goes looking. The old town of Ravenshollo had always been shrouded in mystery. Nestled deep in the woods, it was the kind of place where the wind never seemed to stop howling, and the trees bent just a little too low, as if they were trying to tell a secret. People who lived there would whisper about the woods, but no one dared venture in after dark, not since the disappearances began. It started with small things, a missing dog, a broken window, strange carvings found on trees just outside town. People shrugged it off, thinking it was the work of bored teenagers or animals lurking in the shadows. But then the children began disappearing. The hollow had its legend, every town does. They spoke of an ancient being, something older than the trees themselves, something that lived beneath the forest floor. It fed on fear, it thrived in the dark, and it lured you with whispers. If you heard them, you were already lost. One night, Claire, a local journalist looking for a big break, decided she'd had enough of the town's fear. She was determined to prove it was nothing but a folk tale. Armed with a flashlight, a camera, and a sense of defiance, she entered the woods. The townsfolk watched as she disappeared into the thicket, shaking their heads. Some said silent prayers, others simply turned away. They all knew she wouldn't return. Hours passed, and the town grew still. Ravenshollo had a way of becoming eerily silent, as if even the insects knew when to stop making noise. Then, as midnight approached, they heard it, the soft sound of footsteps. Claire had returned, but something was wrong. Her eyes were wide, too wide, and her face was pale. She stood at the edge of the woods, staring into nothing. The camera dangled from her hand, its lens cracked. The townsfolk called out to her, but she didn't respond. Her lips parted, and a single, raspy breath escaped her throat before she whispered, They're coming. That's when they saw it. Behind her, between the trees, shadows began to move. At first, they were shapeless, mere smudges against the dark. But as they drew closer, they took form, twisted, distorted figures, eyes glinting in the moonlight, mouths gaping in silent screams. They moved unnaturally, their limbs jerking in odd angles, and they were fast, too fast. Claire's body twitched violently, and without another word, she collapsed, her body limp on the cold earth. The camera clattered beside her, its screen flickering to life for a brief moment, showing the last thing she recorded. In the footage, she was running, her breathing frantic, her flashlight bobbing wildly in the dark. But then, the whispers began. Low, guttural murmurs that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. She stopped, turning her head as though hearing something just beyond the trees. The camera shook as she slowly approached a large oak, its bark carved with strange symbols. And then? The screen cut to black. No one saw what happened next, but the townsfolk didn't need to. They already knew. Ravenshollow's legend was true. The thing in the woods had been awakened, and it was hungry. Now, as the night grew colder and the figures crept ever closer, one thing became clear, the whispers weren't just for Claire. They were for all of them. And they had heard. The people of Ravenshollow would never see the dawn. For those watching, if you ever find yourself in a small town surrounded by ancient woods, and you hear whispers in the wind, turn back. Some secrets are better left buried. It all started when they moved into the old house on the edge of town. The Thompsons had been searching for a place with character, 
something different, something that would inspire Sarah, the artist in the family, and give their young daughter me a room to grow. The house, with its peeling paint and vine-covered windows, seemed perfect. At first, it was just the normal things you might expect from an old house, creaks in the floorboards, the occasional draft, and the faint sound of pipes settling at night. But then, something strange began to happen, at first so subtle that they almost missed it. It began with the static. Whenever they turned on the TV, there was a crackling noise, almost like the faint murmur of distant voices. But when they checked the channels, nothing. Just static. No one thought much of it, maybe a glitch with the old wiring or the TV. But it wasn't just the television. The radio in the kitchen crackled, even when it wasn't plugged in. The baby monitor in Mia's room buzzed, picking up faint whispers that sent chills down Sarah's spine. One night, as she lay in bed, staring up at the ceiling, Sarah heard it clearly for the first time, through the walls. A faint, rhythmic scratching sound, like something or someone trying to get out. She shook her husband, Jack, awake. Do you hear that? She whispered, her voice trembling but by the time he was alert, the sound had stopped. Days passed, and the static grew louder. Mia, normally an energetic child, began to change. She spent long hours staring at the wall, her little head cocked as if she were listening to something no one else could hear. One afternoon, Sarah found her sitting in the hallway, tracing the old wallpaper with her fingers. Who are you talking to, sweetie? Sarah asked, gently. Mia looked up, her eyes wide and dark. The lady in the walls, she said simply. Sarah's heart skipped a beat. What lady? Mia smiled. She says she's cold. She wants to come out. The words sent a shiver down Sarah's spine. She called, Jack, but when they looked, there was nothing unusual about the walls. No gaps, no holes. Just peeling wallpaper and dust. But the scratching grew louder each night. Finally, Sarah couldn't take it anymore. One night, after Mia had gone to bed, she grabbed a flashlight and a hammer. She was going to find out what was making that sound. She stood in the hallway, where the noise was loudest, and began to chip away at the wall. At first, there was nothing but plaster and wood. But then? Something else. Cold, damp, and soft. She pulled away more of the wall, her breath quickening, until she uncovered the source of the noise. There, behind the wall, was a small door. Old, rotten, and nailed shut. Her heart raced as she leaned in closer. The scratching stopped. Everything went silent. She stood frozen, waiting, listening. Suddenly, the door creaked open, just a crack. Inside was pitch darkness, but Sarah swore she saw something move. A shadow? A figure? A cold, whispery voice drifted out, I've been waiting. So long? Sarah screamed, dropping the hammer and backing away. The door slammed shut with a deafening thud, and the static returned, louder and sharper than ever before. From that night on, the house was different. Mia no longer spoke of the lady in the walls, but Sarah could still hear her, whispering, scratching, waiting. The Thompsons moved out not long after, leaving the house to its eerie solitude. But they say that if you walk past the old house on the edge of town, you can still hear the static in the walls. And sometimes, if you're quiet enough, the faint sound of someone calling out from behind the door. Waiting to be set free, a young woman, Emily, sits at her desk, staring at her computer screen. The room is cluttered with papers, but her focus is on a mysterious email she received earlier. The subject line reads, Help me. Emily opens the email, 
revealing a single line of text I'm trapped. Come to the old house on Elm Street. The email is signed L. Emily hesitates, but curiosity and concern push her to investigate. Emily drives to the abandoned house on Elm Street. The house is dilapidated, with broken windows and a creaky door. She enters cautiously, the old wood groaning under her weight. The air inside is cold and musty. As she explores the house, she hears faint whispers and the sound of something scratching on the floor above. She follows the noises up a winding staircase. On the top floor, Emily finds a dusty old room with a single chair in the center. There's a laptop on the chair, open to a video chat window. The screen shows an empty room, but the webcam is still active. Suddenly, the laptop screen flickers, and Emily sees a shadowy figure appear on the video call. The figure's face is obscured, but its eyes are glaring directly at her. The figure starts typing frantically, behind you. Emily turns around to see a dark figure standing in the doorway. Panic sets in as she tries to escape, but the door slams shut. The figure advances slowly, its footsteps echoing in the empty house. Emily makes a desperate run for the window. As she's about to break it to escape, the laptop on the chair begins to ring. She glances back and sees the shadowy figure's face clearly for the first time. It's someone she recognizes, her own face. The figure's lips move silently, and the screen starts to show footage of Emily's own home. The video feed reveals the same static-filled room where Emily began, but now it's clear that the house on Elm Street and her own home are somehow connected. Emily smashes the window and escapes into the night. She drives back home, but when she arrives, she finds her own front door ajar. Inside, her room is eerily quiet. She checks her computer, only to find an email from the same address, welcome back. Sometimes, the messages you receive are more than just words. They're warnings. In a desolate valley, shrouded by dense, twisted trees, lay the ruins of an ancient shrine. It was said to have been built long before recorded history, in honor of forgotten gods that predated humanity. Local legends, spoke of demonic presences and whispers from the underworld, where Satan himself was rumored to have walked in the dark of night. But more recently, bizarre sightings of strange lights in the sky gave rise to even more fearsome rumors, of beings from beyond the stars, drawn to the evil beneath the earth. A group of five childhood friends, reunited after years apart, had heard the stories while visiting a nearby village with a family who had roots deep in the region. Among them was a lone investigator, a man known for delving into ancient mysteries and solving inexplicable phenomena. He had come seeking answers, but he hadn't expected the shadows of the past to crawl out of their graves. The friends, intrigued by the village's ominous warnings, convinced the investigator to lead them into the heart of the valley. The family, hesitant at first, decided to accompany them, hoping to put old family secrets to rest. There was something about the shrine that tugged at their ancestral memory, a dark pull they couldn't shake. As they reached the shrine, the air grew heavy, and an unnatural chill seeped into their bones. The investigator, holding an old, tattered journal with cryptic notes, warned them to be careful. The family elder, the only one who could read the ancient script, translated a part of the shrine's inscription, here, beneath the stars, the demons of old and the spirits of the damned await their summoner. Suddenly, the earth trembled beneath their feet, and ghostly whispers echoed through the trees. The friends stood frozen in terror as shadows shifted and formed into twisted, demonic shapes. The investigator tried to rally the group, but as the shrine's ancient stones began to glow, a thunderous roar split the air. Above them, the sky was torn apart, revealing a massive UFO, its lights scanning the ground as if searching for something, or someone. The family's youngest member, a teenage girl, began to speak in a voice not her own, her eyes rolling back into her head. She pointed toward the sky and whispered, 
they are coming. And he is with them. Before anyone could react, the ghosts of long-dead worshippers materialized, circling the group, their eyes glowing with a hellish light. From the center of the shrine, a deep, booming voice called out, the pact is renewed. And with that, the very gates of hell began to open. There is a village, tucked away in the remote mountains of Eastern Europe, a place where time seems to have stopped centuries ago. Only a few people remain, living quietly in old stone houses, their windows shuttered even during the day. The air is heavy, as if the sky itself is weighed down by something unseen, something ancient and dark. In this forgotten village lived a man named Thomas, a young farmer who had recently moved into his late grandfather's home. Thomas had heard stories about the village's cursed past, about the shadow beneath, an ancient evil said to dwell deep in the earth, waiting to be awakened. But Thomas was a modern man, a skeptic, and he dismissed the tales as nothing more than superstition. One night, as a storm raged outside, Thomas found an old, crumbling journal hidden beneath a loose floorboard in his grandfather's study. It was filled with strange, cryptic entries written in a shaky hand. The final entry was barely legible, scrawled hastily across the page. Do not go near the well. The darkness will rise. The shadow stirs. Curiosity gnawed at Thomas, and against his better judgment, he decided to investigate the well mentioned in the journal. It was said to be ancient, older than the village itself, built by hands long since turned to dust. The well had been sealed shut with a heavy stone slab generations ago, but the villagers refused to speak of it, save in hushed whispers. Thomas waited until dawn and made his way to the well, which lay on the outskirts of the village, hidden in the overgrown forest. The storm had passed, but the air felt thick and unnaturally still. As he approached the well, a sudden gust of wind howled through the trees, and the faint sound of whispering voices seemed to drift from the direction of the village. Thomas shrugged it off, attributing it to his imagination. The well was covered in moss and dirt, its stones cracked and worn by centuries of neglect. He could feel a strange pull, almost as if something was calling to him from beneath the earth. Thomas reached for the slab, determined to see what his grandfather had feared so deeply. With a grunt, he pushed the heavy stone aside, revealing the dark, gaping mouth of the well. As he peered into the blackness below, an overwhelming sense of dread washed over him. The air around the well was colder, unnaturally so, and the faint scent of decay wafted up from its depths. He dropped a small rock into the well, listening for the sound of it hitting the bottom. But the sound never came. Instead, the whispers grew louder, and a strange, wet slithering noise echoed up from the darkness. Thomas backed away, his heart pounding. He knew he should leave, seal the well, and never return. But before he could move, the ground beneath him trembled. The air grew thicker, more oppressive, and the whispers became voices, clear, insidious voices that spoke in an ancient language, though Thomas understood every word. We have waited. And now you have come. A dark shadow began to rise from the well, a formless mass of pure, writhing darkness. It twisted and coiled like smoke, but it was solid, tangible. The shape took on a vaguely humanoid form, though its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, and its voice was the sound of countless souls crying out in torment. The shadow beneath had awoken. Thomas tried to run, but the shadow moved faster, wrapping around his legs and dragging him toward the well. He screamed, clawing at the ground, but there was no one to hear him. As he was pulled into the well, the last thing he saw was the sky above growing darker, as if the very light of the world was being devoured. Weeks later, a traveler passing through the village noticed something strange. The homes were abandoned, the doors left open as if their occupants had fled in a hurry. The traveler ventured further into the village and found the well, its stone cover shattered into pieces. 
The air around the well was thick with an unnatural cold, and in the silence, the faint sound of whispering could be heard. The traveller left, never to return. The village was forgotten once more, but the shadow beneath remained, waiting for the next soul foolish enough to awaken it.